Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the most recent episode of the History Unplugged podcast. Today, what I want to do is take a look at something that is widely understood as a transformational moment in American history, and then go back and look at how it was received by the people at the time. What I'm going to talk about is Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal. That's understood to be a watershed moment in the relationship between a typical American citizen and the U.S. government and what the obligations of the government were. And I'm speaking very broadly here, but before the New Deal, the U.S. government defended liberty in a negative way. By negative, I mean that it did not infringe upon people's liberty and it left them alone. After the New Deal, the government would protect liberty in a positive way, meaning that it would positively get involved with people's life and opponents would say it encroached on people's lives and liberty. Well, we understand that it happened. We understand it was transformational. But what gets lost in this discussion is the type of opposition that existed at the time. And I think this is a topic that merits its own episode because the opposition to the New Deal was very interesting. Opposition didn't just come from those who thought that the New Deal was an overreach on the U.S. Constitution. There were some who thought that the New Deal didn't go far enough. That's because the New Deal happened during the Great Depression, and the economic situation was dire enough that it spawned very radical ideas. There were advocates for socialism, communism, fascism, and fascism wasn't a dirty word before World War II and even a movement called technocracy. This was a progressive engineering movement that wanted to do away with the capitalist price system in favor of one that used an energy theory of value. So proponents of technocracy argued that energy certificates equal to the amount of power available for production should be issued to each citizen, who'd then be required to spend them in a free market. The idea was that it would help balance production and consumption. So this is an interesting time in history. When there are many skeptics of capitalism, when many believe that the Soviet Union is riding out the Great Depression much better in capitalistic countries in Western Europe and the United States, and that an alternative needs to be found. And this is something most people don't know, but opposition to the New Deal went so far that a group of Wall Street millionaires literally plotted to overthrow the president. Now, FDR was no saint in all of these different happenings. At one point, he wanted to pack the Supreme Court in order to get enough political power that there couldn't be a significant blowback or curtailing to the New Deal. And I'll talk about that, too. So in this episode, I'll discuss what the New Deal is. Then I'll look at some of the figures who oppose the New Deal from different sides. And these are both politicians. One is Huey Long, who's a very colorful character. The other one is a presidential candidate, Wendell Wilkie, who, before Donald Trump in 2016, was the only serious presidential candidate who had absolutely no political experience whatsoever and argued that he was qualified for the office based on his business experience. Then I'll talk about Roosevelt's court packing plan. And finally, I'll look at the plot by Wall Street millionaires to literally overthrow the president. So let's discuss what the New Deal was. At Roosevelt's nationally broadcast inauguration speech in 1933, The new president denounced the money changers, as he called them, who had brought on the economic disaster of the Great Depression and declared that the government must wage war on the Great Depression as it would against an armed foe. Roosevelt's solution to the problems was to aggressively use government as a tool for creating a new deal for the American people, aimed at three R's, relief, recovery, and reform. The New Deal's most immediate goals were short-range relief and immediate recovery, These were the immediate goals of the 100 Days Congress, which met March 9th to June 6th, 1933. Long-range goals of permanent recovery and the reform of institutional abuses and practices that led to the Great Depression came as part of the Second New Deal, which lasted from November 1933 to 1939. Well, the first order of business was the banking system. Roosevelt's first priority was to deal with the crisis of bank failures. Two days after his inauguration, the president declared a nationwide banking holiday and then called a special session of Congress. With sizable Democratic majorities in both houses, the new Congress was ready to rubber stamp bills drafted by the White House, and they gave the president himself extraordinary blank check powers, in some cases delegating to him legislative authority. Only eight hours into the emergency session, Congress passed the Emergency Banking Relief Act, 
which gave the president absolute control over the national finances and foreign exchange of the United States. This, along with the Federal Reserve's commitment to supply unlimited amounts of currency to reopen banks, the new law created de facto 100% deposit insurance. And before that, there wasn't deposit insurance, which led to the run-on and closure of a lot of banks after 1929. Well, President Roosevelt understood the power of radio, so he did his best to communicate his message directly to the people as much as possible. He was the first president to use it effectively as a tool of what some say is propaganda. The president gave the first of his fireside chats on March 12, 1933, to about 35 million people. He told the audience that it was now safer to keep money in a reopened bank than under the mattresses. When the banks opened their doors, Deposits easily outpace withdrawals. A month later, Congress reformed the banking system with the Glass-Steagall Banking Reform Act. This law created the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, which insured individual deposits up to $5,000, and this was later raised several times. The days when individual Americans lost their entire life savings because of a bank failure, which was a situation that existed for more than 100 years, were now over. Roosevelt took further economic action by ordering all private holdings of gold to be surrendered to the Treasury by taking the country off the gold standard and reducing the value of the gold content of the dollar to 59 cents. Roosevelt's theory was that controlled inflation would stimulate business. Prices did rise somewhat, but not in proportion to the change in the value of the currency. Purchasing power of the newly shrunken dollar wasn't substantially inferior to that of the old, except in purchases from foreigners. In 1933, Congress passed the Securities Act. The goal of the law was to require issuers of securities, which is a type of financial investment, to fully disclose all material information that a reasonable shareholder would require in order to make up his or her mind about the potential investment. This was followed by the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, which regulates the secondary trading of those securities between persons, often unrelated to the insurer, frequently through brokers or dealers. The Securities and Exchange Commission was set up to enforce the federal securities laws and to regulate the securities industry, the nation's stock and options exchanges, and other electronic securities markets in the United States later on. So the idea of all these regulations is to eliminate fraud and instill confidence in the markets. One of the most famous legacies of the New Deal are different job creation programs, and you can still see the effects of these job creation programs in small towns across the United States through different types of public works. So at the time of Roosevelt's inauguration, about 25% of the nation's labor force was unemployed. This was the highest percentage in the nation's history, and there wasn't any social safety net to provide them any relief. There was immediate need for job creation, and Roosevelt had no reservations about using federal dollars to address the program. The first act was the Beer Wine Revenue Act, which was passed on day 14 of the 100 days. This was the fulfillment of a campaign promise to amend the Volstead Act, which allowed for the manufacture, sale, and distribution of beer and wine with an alcohol content of less than 3.2% by volume. This law still affects sort of the weaker legacy of American beers. This was a stopgap measure that lasted until the passage of the 21st Amendment, which repealed Prohibition, enacted by the 18th Amendment. It provided jobs and created a new stream of revenue. Nine days later, Congress created the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was probably one of the most popular of all New Deal programs. The CCC provided unskilled manual labor jobs for about 3 million unmarried young men, many of whom otherwise would have been unemployed or could have gotten into criminal activity. Organized into outdoor government camps, the CCC worked in conservation and development of land resources owned by federal, state, and local governments. They planted about 3 billion trees to replace forests that had been devastated by industrialization. They fought fires, worked in flood control, drained swamplands, built public access and service roads in rural areas, and some 800 parks were created, and most state parks were updated. A worker for the CCC earned about $30 per month in wages, and a lot of this was typically set home to family. A huge bit of economic recovery was made when the 100 Days Congress passed the National Industrial Recovery Act on June 16, 1933, which created the National Recovery Administration, or the NRA. The NRA was the most complex and far-reaching of New Deal programs. It was designed to assist industry, labor, and the unemployed, first with immediate relief, and then with long-range recovery and reform. 
Over 200 individual industries were required to work out codes of fair competition, which place a ceiling on the maximum hours of labor per week allowed each worker and a minimum wage for which he would labor. Workers were guaranteed the right to organize or grant a collective bargaining rights through representatives of their own choosing. Anti-union contracts were expressly forbidden, and further safeguards were enacted to protect against child labor. So the idea was that if you were a wealthy industrialist, you couldn't just have a race to the bottom of wages with all of your workers because you had an unlimited labor pool, essentially, and you could charge almost slave wages. So the idea of this law was a safeguard against it. But opponents of the law would say that the effect of this has mutated so that if you're a local government, you can only hire union companies, and this vastly inflates the cost of public projects. So there's both sides to a lot of these things. In 1935, Congress created the Works Progress Administration, or WPA. It was the largest New Deal agency, which was designed to employ millions on useful projects, including the construction of public buildings, bridges, and roads. Almost every community in the United States had a park, bridge, or school constructed by the agency, especially in rural and western areas. Over a period of eight years, some 9 million Americans were employed in tasks ranging from controlling crickets in Wyoming to building a monkey cage in Oklahoma City. The WPA engaged the unemployed in professional-specific jobs, including arts, drama, media, and literacy projects. Artists were employed to create murals in public post offices and schools, resulting in the creation of 10 million works of art. The WPA hired musicians to form orchestras, which produced recordings for the radio. Some 6,000 were employed by the Federal Writers Project, which went to the South and conducted interviews with the nation's aging population of former slaves. So we have an incredible amount of records of former slaves who, this is in the 1930s, so they'd be in their 80s or 90s by now, and I've used these resources on the podcast before. And there's about 2,300 first-person slave narratives, and they're housed at the Library of Congress, and many are available online in audio form. So between 1935 and 1943, the WPA provided almost 8 million jobs at a cost of over $14 billion. The goal was never full employment, but it tried to provide one paid job for all families where the breadwinner suffered long-term unemployment. Now, objections to WA programs focus on wastefulness and inefficiency, that they were essentially digging a big hole, paying people to dig a big hole and then fill it back up. Critics said that WPA stood for We Provide Alms. And just some of the other big New Deal programs, one is the Farm Security Administration, or FSA, which stressed rural rehabilitation efforts to improve the lifestyle of sharecroppers and tenants and poor landowning farmers, and this is right after the Dust Bowl happened. This wasn't a very successful program. The goal was to purchase submarginal land owned by poor farmers and resettle them in group farms on land more suitable for efficient farming. But this experiment in collectivized farming failed because farmers wanted ownership. Another New Deal program was the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was created in 1933. There was a huge construction project to develop the hydroelectric potential of the Tennessee River. Private utilities complained bitterly and either reduced their rates or went out of business. Critics called the TVA creeping socialism in concrete. But the giant program brought employment to the region, it reduced soil erosion problems, and provided for better river navigation. And lots of other federal agencies that we know of today were created in the New Deal. You have the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA to speed recovery of the housing industry. Social Security was enacted in 1935, which provided a safety net for the elderly. A retirement pension for old age workers ranging from $10 to $85 a month. Provisions were also provided for the blind, the physically handicapped, fatherless children, and other dependents. So those are some of the effects of the New Deal. Now, criticism to the New Deal was heavily politicized because the New Deal was a political project. It came about due to the 1932 election, which was a realignment election. The Democratic Party, with the New Deal, became a liberal party supported by big city political machines, labor unions, and blue-collar workers, ethnic minorities, farmers, white Southerners, the impoverished, and intellectuals. It was a major resurgence for the Democratic Party, which had been very weak ever since the end of the Civil War. The Democratic coalition was so powerful that Democrats won the White House seven out of nine elections from 1932 to 1968, 
as well as control of both houses of Congress during all but four years between 1932 and 1980. 